to go ahead and read this. I'm sorry, but it's, I'm not sorry for you guys because y'all... <clears throat> Amen. Okay, so the, t the subtitle is called The Dilemma Pertaining to God's Power Today. And we were talking about that reality that, that today people... I mean, think about it now, and I, so I wouldn't comment, but we, I think it's good to really look at the whole picture. Today in most churches, people are going, you know, well, where's the power? I mean, they really are, and they're, they're freaking out. You know, back in the, what, 70s and 80s, there was the charismatic movement. You saw miracles and all this kind of stuff all the time. And uh, so um, much of the stories of the Bible are examples of God's people in conflict with oppression and with helplessness. Such examples are, are Israel in bondage in Egypt, the people of God facing the Philistines, and, and one particular one in the form of Goliath, the captivity by the Assyrians, or the Baptists, I mean Babylonians, and so many more stories. At the time of the appearance of Christ, Israel was under bondage and in great turmoil. All right. At the time of the writing of the book of Revelation, the people of God, are in, under oppression and bondage and great turmoil. Just like today, just like then, just like <clears throat> at the time. Um, it, it might be remembered that the poor and the outcast and the infirmed seemed to be the ones who drew most to, to Jesus. The power of God as known in the cross is more easily embraced by the underdog. This is because the mighty of this world tend to not be as open to the way of Christ crucified due to the fact that the guiding force behind their power tends to be self-centered. Therefore, it becomes self-exalting and self-serving in its core. All right, so uh, why would, uh, and th this was something I never got around to, to sharing in 1 Corinthians. There's so much good stuff there that I never got around to, but um, one of the issues was that a lot of the Corinthians were people who were well off. And a bunch of these poor people got brought into the congregation and they were having problems with, you know, having to put up with poor people. And um, um, they were, they, well, they were, you know, and it's like, well, this is, this is messing with our status. You know, it's messing with our status. I want to be, you know, somebody asked me, somebody asked me not that long ago, they said, do you remember the, the guy that looked so-and-so and he had a son and he looked so-and-so and stuff? And, and they said, whatever happened to that guy and his family? And they said, well, I never really understood why they would be in our church. And this was when we were over on Bolivar. And he, he was fairly well off and whatever the family was. And <clears throat> well, he had invited me to Corpus Christi down on a weekend to get away and spend some time with the Lord. And he wanted to hang out with me some too. And, and I said, well, while we're driving down there, I said, well, why did you ever, how did you even find our church and why did you start coming to our church? And he said, well, you know, all the churches that I've gone to, the pastors and their wife always look like Poor, dumb people. And said, you and your wife were good looking. <laughs> I went, well, thank you very much. No, 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 I did not. <laughs> I don't remember what I said, but I was flabbergasted. That's why you chose new creation. <clears throat> anyway. Um, yeah, there you go. <clears throat> so for the, poor, for the poor and needy being overpowered with no hope of gaining the status, the resources, and the privileges of the mighty opens one up to the possibilities of alternative methods of gaining power, in this case, the power of Christ crucified. Um, because in oppression, there is power through Christ crucified. And that's one of the things that we're going to really get into, Lord willing, as we go. All right. Some living in repressed situations have turned to Christ to gain a new level of power. However, this is not the same as, as turning to Christ crucified and the power offered by the cross. I wish to make a differentiation between the two. In turning to Christ, they have sought out God's 
supernatural resources. In other words, they want power. They want miracles. They want God to move on their finances. They want to see. And, and you know, we believe God for that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm, I, I'm really, I'm not trying to belittle that. I thank God for it. But that's not the power that God preached and that Paul preached and that's set forth in the scriptures. And it's certainly not the power that's set forth in the book of Revelation because we've already, we already read through a whole ton of scriptures where if victory in the way that most people think of it is the deal, then the saints are losing the battle. But they're not. We haven't, seen, we haven't seen the lay of the land yet to see how this thing, the whole book turns on, on these people who are surrendered to Christ crucified. Uh, but they have sought supernatural resources to help them gain or match the status of one who could be considered nobler than what they were previously. In some cases, the goal has not been advancement in status as much as by God's miracle working power, seeking to gain material possessions of a higher quality. God will do miracles. God will give you this. God will give you that, you know. One of my favorite stories was a lady I worked with, and, and she, was, she was a charismatic believer, and she, she drove up in this big Cadillac one day because we had this big front area where you could see everybody, and she drove up in this big Cadillac, and uh, she knew I was a Christian, and walked up and I said, where did you get that? And she said, the Lord gave, gave me that. I said, you're kidding me, really? She said, yeah. I said, how did it happen? She says, well, I was driving down the road and I, I was looking for a, uh, another car and I saw this used car lot and there it was sitting on there. I said, did the guy just give it to you? No, I paid for it. But there, you know, I'm just, is that any different than the rest of us? <laughs> You know, that see a car we like on a car like that, and then we pay money for it. Anyway, I'm sorry, but I, <laughs> that's never left me. <laughs> um, so uh, gain, gaining in material possessions, uh, through these means, these saints have found a new form of empowerment, and such advancements... Are, uh, are gained by the means of the power of God. However, this is not the power that we're talking about here in the book of Revelation. Last paragraph, in pursuing God's supernatural power, they seek through God's help to take back control of their out of control lives. And there's nothing wrong with that because that's what happens in the book of Revelation. They are seeking God to be able to take back control of their lives but it's in a different manner. They do have control. They do have a say, and they do have tremendous power, but it's, it's not through what we call supernatural resources. Um, the allure to such churches and ministries is the hope of gaining power in a world where they previously had none. Who can blame them? However, Paul in 1 Corinthians offers them an alternative to the power had by the world, and the power had by what some might call spiritual advancement. All right. All right, now we get into it. Uh, I'm going to have a little trouble reading this because I printed it out just before I left, and it's, it's faded, and I, I'm one of those poor people that can't afford a cartridge. <laughs> God help us all. Revelation chapter 5. Turn with me. <clears throat> verse 1. Revelation 5 verse 1. <clears throat> and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose the seals? And no man, no man, no man in heaven, no man in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the scroll, neither to look on it. And I wept much, because this is John speaking here, I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the scroll, neither to look on it. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of 
Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the scrolls and to loose its seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and he took the scroll out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, four living creatures and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on the earth. <clears throat> um, that's it. Let's read a little further here. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them, the 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature that is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. All right. So we've all read this. Um, and we, we've all thought that this was like a picture of heaven and that this is like a prophetic picture or this is like that. Well, it is and it isn't. It is a definition. It is imagery that defines God's answer for these poor and, and despised and hunted believers that are the seven church representative by the seven churches. <clears throat> so let me just read a little bit of this. And having addressed the problem of each church in chapters one through three, there he talked about the problems, each of the problems and this and that. Having shown how Christ in their midst was to be the answer, and that's Revelation 1, 13 and 20, he starts and he's in the midst of the seven of the of the the churches of the candlestick. He still ends up outside the church knocking to get in. Outside the church. Okay? And this in spirit has happened to them and John is dealing with these churches and it's right after that that he begins to give Jesus' messages to these churches. Look, you've, this, I have this against you and you've done this and you've opened up to this and that and whatever. He has, the, Christ has been declared, and Christ has been declared central in the midst of them, okay? In the midst of the church. And even with that, he ends up outside, knocking to what? Just to get in, because he, where, where does he want to live? In us. In the church. And, you know, and as we know, many people have used these scriptures to try to win, win souls, behold, he stands at the door of your heart and knocks. But that is, you know, I mean, I don't mean it in the worst ways or at least not as bad as it sounds, but it's a perversion of those scriptures. Those scriptures are not dealing with knocking on your heart for salvation. It's knocking on the door of the church to get back in and become the central figure of what their existence is based upon. All right. Having done all of that and brought them all the way through now he's ready to start painting a different picture. He's, he is ready to set forth an imagery that's going to blow them out of the water. Okay? And it will because of where they're at and what this image has just begun to be painted, this imagery 
uh, in picture form. <clears throat> um, so, yet it did not take long for the churches to place Jesus on the outside knocking to get back in. In order to not make the same mistake, they needed a new vision of who Jesus was. Because the Jesus that they knew was real, but it wasn't um, fully formed. Paul said, I pray that Christ be formed. They had Christ. Remember this, Galatians 4, 19. They had Christ, but he wasn't a clear-cut Christ. He wasn't clearly formed in their understanding. And so they needed a new vision of who Jesus was. John now sets out to show them the specific way in which they might further find answers. <clears throat> All right, throughout the rest of the book, okay, this is the rest of the book, throughout the rest of the book, John will present to them a hope from which they may draw while in the throes of weakness and distress. A hope right in the middle of distress and weakness and lack. And yet, if you can imagine being in such a uh, downcast position and having a tremendous hope, never, never becoming hopeless, no matter how bad things got, okay? Okay. Um, it is in the face of the very great conflicts encountered by these churches that John, the last living apostle, sets forth one symbol, one symbol above all others, to note the power from on high. It is the Lamb. However, however, it's not just the Lamb, but it is the Lamb slaughtered. It's the slaughtered Lamb. Now, we're not going to take the time at this moment to read back through and see that it's not talking about the salvation lamb as way, the way we read these scriptures. Listen carefully. Let them be at least seeds to you because this is important. It's not. We have read this as the salvation, the Savior dying for us, and that's how we're saved. This is not dealing with salvation. They're already saved, folks. This is the churches, okay? He's not presenting uh, <clears throat> that Jesus died for them. He's presenting how the victory was won, and it was through him becoming a slaughtered lamb, okay? I, I, I'm going to tell you honestly, I don't know that I fully understand it. So, I'm, I mean, I do somewhat, and you do somewhat, but please allow the Holy Spirit the privilege to be able to, to explain way further than anything I could ever do. <clears throat> um, so, however, it is not just the lamb, but a slaughtered lamb, one beaten and abused, just as these seven churches were. As conditions in their lives seem to get worse and worse, John sets this image as the ensign to which they are to look. As the dark forces gain more and more control, their actions lay the groundwork for the appearance of God's Savior. As the things get worse and worse and the beasts get more and more control, they, the beast, their actions are laying the groundwork for the appearance of God's Savior, the slain Lamb of God. Not just historically, not just the seven churches, not just today, but not just today, every day, but not just every day throughout all eternity. This is the symbol that he's going to set forth as the answer for, for all eternity and all churches and will be the final wrap-up of what God has to say. Book of Revelation, shut, end, over with. That's my period. That's my point right there. Okay? So I'm just going to read this one portion of scriptures again. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. One of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four creatures, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Okay. Now, the, the imagery here 
is, as it were, the seven churches and all churches gathered, all right? And they are well familiar, well familiar with the lion of the tribe of Judah, okay? You follow it? People on Skype, anyway? They are well familiar with that. Let me, let me read it. Well, everyone was familiar with the line of the tribe of Judah, under whose banner Israel enjoyed the best years of their existence. They were now totally shocked to have that grand reality redefined from heaven above as a defeated weakling of a creature. That the lion of the tribe of Judah, when seen for who he really is and how the victory was won, he was seen as a weakling of a creature, a slain lamb. In this picture found in Revelation 5, a great discovery is unveiled to all who belong to Jesus and are gathered unto him. All of those, all those people. This is an imagery set to open the eyes of all God's people. This is, uh, you know, we'll get into it, but this is, this is like a moment where he is changing the course of what they've been going through, and he's going to change the whole, their whole history by this. <clears throat> the Lion of Judah with whom they were all well acquainted and, and admired is found out to be best represented by a lamb image. Best represented by a lamb image. John sees these things while in exile and in prison. Remember, he said, come up here, but John is exiled. Can I get amen? John is imprisoned. John is left alone. The other disciples were killed by these victors, these beasts, these monsters, these things that are in control. Do you understand that? This guy is, I, your fellow brother, in tribulation, I know. And, and yet, he's not in captivity. He is before the lamb that was slain. You see that? He's not bound. And he's, he's like the testimony of it, but at the same time, this God-given imagery is coming up, and he too at times is moved and shaken by it. I think it's, I, I didn't mark it, so it's probably, um, let's see if I can find it real quick. I should have marked it. There's a particular scripture that's wonderful at that point. So clearly, clearly they were not expecting to see a lamb, much less a slaughtered lamb. Here's your, here's your victory. <laughs> here's the height of glory. Here's the height of worship. Here's the image, the imagery to which all bow down and all are gathered unto. He speaks for God. He speaks as he hears from God. He speaks in imagery that is shocking. Um, I've got it written here, but it's shocking because think of these seven churches. I want you to think of what it says they went through. It was tough, wasn't it? Tough times. I mean, some of them... I mean, the devil's content, not, you know, devils or whatever. Satan is mentioned in the midst of three of them. Just incredible. Think of the best worship service they would ever have. And then think of this picture. Everything is just going, yeah, it's heavenly. I mean, I've got it. I'll read it to you. But it's just like, it's just like they're just like, oh, my God. God, look at this. Look at the presence of this reality. They have been caught away into a, an imagery. And, and what it is saying is, do you, you know, do you see the glory? Do you see the joy? Do you see the victory? This is you in your seven churches. I'm painting you as you are when you behold and comprehend the Lamb. That's, this is you. 
You keep looking at you and thinking, uh, becoming open to alternative methods of power. You keep, you know, wanting victory or wanting this and that. This is you around this throne. This is who you are when you are when you see things are right. This is not someone else. This is you. <clears throat> huh. Um, so clearly they were not expecting to see a lamb, much less a slaughtered lamb. Because it was so compelling and contrasting, it appeared that even John might have been taken back by the magnitude of this imagery. From the picture presented to us here in Revelation 5, we too are meant to be shocked into a realization, a revelation of the high place given of God to the slaughtered lamb. Not Now let me try to explain this again. Not the slaughtered lamb that, of salvation, but the slaughtered lamb of selfless giving. That weak, beat up thing, it doesn't matter if he saved you. He's not even talking in that sense of it. He's it's saying, that, that's my image of power and of glory. Glory to the Lamb. All power to the Lamb. The slain Lamb. It's, it's meant to send reverberations through the people of God to be awakened to God's view of this whole thing. And that's what they're seeing in this imagery. They're seeing God's view. This is you now. Wake up. And when you see this, when you see this, you are in victory. And if you don't see it, you are what you are in the seven churches. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord. <clears throat> All right. So it is meant to bring about a new focus, a new object of worship, and a new awakening as to what God God's supreme answer uh, is. So, subtitle, what has, been, what has been the victory? I think this is really cool. I think something happened with this multitude. I think when they were brought up into this imagery, I think they, their minds ran through their history. I mean, an ancient people. And it ran through their history, and all of a sudden, they realized we're looking at the answer that's always been our answer, and we never saw it as the answer. So for those gathered, maybe a new dawning took place at the vision of the Lamb. For example, here in Revelation 5, heaven is in tears until the Lamb appears. They're in tears, but when the Lamb appears, there's victory, okay? Is it possible? that their thoughts ran back to years of history where their victory came by means of a slain lamb. Egypt kept Israel in bondage for 400 years until the lamb appears, the slain lamb. Not the, not the nine, you know, nine miracles. Not one of those plagues delivered them. Can I get amen? Not one miracle delivered them. The slain lamb delivered them. And they're all of a sudden shooting back and going, oh my God, wait a minute. Uh, for Israel, it was maybe the lamb, they're thinking back, and they say, well, it was, it was the lamb that took the brunt of pain for throughout their existence when confronted with their own sins and failures. It was always the lamb that saved them from punishment and sin. The lamb was their savior. You see that? They slay a lamb every time. And now they're seeing the lamb. And they're shooting back through all the imagery and they're going, oh, we're looking, this has been the answer. This has always freed us. Always this was the, not the conquering king. That's the one that has saved us and has freed us. <clears throat> and the, another subtitle, what is worship? Another great discovery is made in this scene. The readers are introduced to a grand vision of glorious worship. It is worship beyond what they have ever seen. It is heavenly worship. I, I mean, come on. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think of our best worship service here and then being yanked up into that and going, oh my God, yeah, 
Yes. Okay. That's the, that's the way it should be in our heart. Do you understand that? When we view the slain lamb as God's victory, as the weakness of God being more powerful than men. Hallelujah. It is worship beyond what they had ever seen. In this picture with which they are presented, they are given the object that God has chosen to receive the height of true heavenly worship. God set that image forth. And God set it forth to these churches that were struggling and that were beaten and hunted and hated and outcast from their own people and hunted by the Romans and uh, and he said, and he's, he's say, and, and just like John has come and said, I, even though I am among you now to share this message, I, even at this same moment, am an exile and imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos. And yet here we are. You are going through all that you're going through. And yet here's the truth. And here's what turns. Here's what brings the victory every time. And here, this slain lamb, not just a lamb, this slain lamb, this is what is to be worshipped above everything else. Worthy is a lamb that was slain. Hallelujah. So, um, what, what object has God chosen? This grand display of God ordered worship, uh, of God ordered worship is focused on the Lamb. But wait, look closer. This worship is directed toward a slain Lamb. We worship you, slain Lamb. Anybody with me on that? <laughs> we worship you, slain Lamb. You are worthy. Not because you, you saved us, but because you're you are God's victory. You are God's way. You are the picture of what's going to bring us through our situation, just like you're bringing John through it, our messenger and our brother in tribulation, and just like you brought every one of the disciples through it and all the churches of the future, this selfless giving, dying so that even the worst can benefit and happy to do it. And they're the ones that are putting you through it. Slain lamb, you are worthy, worthy of all praise and all glory. Here the seven churches are introduced to what is the highest and the greatest that can be found in the heart of God. These churches may have had other ideas about what was greatest or what was needed most. For example, they probably they were probably waiting for and looking for the Lion of Judah to appear and defeat their enemies along with all their problems. This imagery is meant by God to confront that mentality as well as to lift their view to that of his view. Okay. So, just like Israel, when they when uh, they're waiting for the Messiah, they're looking for a conquering king. And when they see this slain lamb, the Passover lamb, every lamb, the burnt offering, they're all summed up in this one, whatever all those sacrifices were, they're summed up in one. Jesus fulfilled all of them in one death. And they see him hanging weak and helpless and bloody. And they walk away shaking their heads saying, God, we hope that we, this was the answer. We, we really thought he was the one. I mean, he had such power when he walked the earth. And now look at him. And now look at him for all eternity. I mean, look at him for all eternity. That's what he is. But he's on that throne because he didn't think it was something to be grasped after to be equal with God, but humbled himself and became a man and then became a servant man and then he became a slave, obedient unto death, 
even the death of the cross, wherefore God hath highly exalted him. And again, those scriptures do not mention salvation one time. Now, I don't, I don't know if that means what it, to you what it does to me, but when I saw it, I realized this is God glorifying just the selfless giving, not the result to me. That was, a, that was earth shattering to me, folks. So that's why, you, you know, if you wonder why I repeat stuff, it's like, well, this means so much to me, you know. It's, and it's not just words. It's like, he never mentioned salvation. He never mentioned the result. He never, and he didn't say, and he, he saved people, and he was, you know, he, you know, he was full of wisdom and all of this stuff. He said he was so self-giving on to death that that's why I exalted him. Well, we're getting in and getting almost time to quit. We're also getting into the parts that maybe I can reprint later and read a little better here. Uh, so maybe I've hit you with a lot here. Um, there's some good subtitles here. The next one is the symbol representing God's power revealed. The significance of Revelation 5 for the seven churches. The need to see as God sees. Seeing with new eyes, lamb's eyes. Remember he had seven eyes. Experiencing victory in the midst of defeat. Problem, then lamb is honored. This is, this is going to be great part when we get to this little part. Uh, we go through the book of Revelation and we show that every time there was a horrible display of beastly control, they laid down their lives and everything went up to heaven to the Lamb in glory every time. Every time. It's just powerful. It's so powerful. And then we explain the lamb opening the seals. It's, we're just now getting to the fun part, folks. <laughs> Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you that he is a selfless one who made himself weak for the benefit of others and the beauty of that selflessness, Lord, because we're so selfish. Lord, we're like the dogs that fight for the scraps underneath the table. But you, you willingly give up. But you do it knowing that life comes out of death. That there is a way to turn these things. There is a power. As seen in the book of Revelation over and over, here's what turns that. Here's what turns that. Here's what turns that. Father, give us grace to be tender of heart and hungry to see you. We ask in Jesus' name.